Welcome to examination of the spine. When we see a patient in the orthopedic clinic, it is our role to elicit the chief complaint that the patient presents with. At that point, we want to get some more details on the chief complaint and elicit a good history. By this time, if you've done a good job with your chief complaint and your history elicitation, you should have a fairly good indication of what the patient's underlying problem is or what the pain generators are that precipitated that office visit. At that point, you go on to doing an examination, you review the investigations that you have, and you should come up with one or possibly two diagnoses that will explain the patient's symptoms. What we're going to go over today with you is how to assess a patient who presents to the orthopedic clinic with spinal complaints. A good way to assess spinal complaints is to divide them systematically into whether the patient is complaining of axial symptoms or radicular symptoms or myelopathic symptoms. Axial symptoms are symptoms that the patient has directly in line with the axis of the body so they may be either neck pain mid-back pain, low back pain. Radicular symptoms are when the nerve root gets irritated and pinched and the patient has pain going down along the course of a nerve into the arm if it's from the cervical spine or into the leg if it's from the lumbar spine. Myelopathic symptoms are long tracked symptoms from pressure either on the cervical or thoracic spinal cord. Like you know, the spinal cord ends at the L1, L2 level. So to get myelopathic symptoms, you have to have pressure on the cord anywhere above the L1, 2 disc level. If you have a patient come in to you with cervical spine related problems, they may come in with three broad groups of symptoms. They may have axial neck pain, which is right here along the axis of the neck. They may have radicular symptoms going down in their arm. Or they may have myelopathic symptoms from pressure on the spinal cord. The most important thing if they have neck pain is to ask the patient where the neck pain is. Their neck pain may be anteriorly along the sternocleidomastoid muscle as we commonly see after a motor vehicle injury where they have a little sprain of the muscle or the neck pain may be posterior right here. If it's posterior it could be muscular or it may be somehow referred to the disc or facet joints. If it is posterior you should delve a little deeper and find out if the pain is suboccipital somewhere beneath the occiput or if it's subaxial lower down in the neck. If it's suboccipital pain, you get an idea that some of the upper cervical vertebrae or joints may be contributing to that pain. If it's subaxial over here, then you suspect that they may have muscle pain or pain related to the facets or disc joints in the subaxial cervical spine. You test their neck range of motion. When you test range of motion, you test their neck range of motion in flexion. You test their neck range of motion in extension and lateral rotation to this side, to the other side, and lateral bending to this side and to the other side. If they have worsening of their pain in the back of the neck with neck flexion, that's a fairly good sign that that might be muscular pain. If they initially complained of posterior neck pain, but their neck pain is worse when you extend, you should suspect that they may have a discogenic component to their pain or that the discs are partially at least involved in the production of that pain. When a patient has radicular symptoms or pain going down the arm from pinching of the nerve root and inflammation of the nerve root in the cervical spine, oftentimes they might come to your office or you might initially see them with their head cocked to one side just like this. And the reason they do this is because in this position the nerve root gets unpinched 
just a little bit and they get relief of the arm pain going down into this side. They may also present with what's called a shoulder abduction sign where they come to your office with one hand resting on top of their head. And the reason they do that is because in this position the nerve root going down into this arm gets unkinked and decreased pressure and that relieves some of the radicular pain they have in this arm. If you ask them to cock their neck to one side and extend the neck just a little bit, this is known as a spurling maneuver. In this position, oftentimes they'll get radicular pain going down just like this into the arm with the neck cocked back and rotated to this side. In patients who present with symptoms that are suggestive of cervical radiculopathy, it's very important to rule out other conditions in the upper extremities that may be masquerading as cervical radiculopathy. Some of the common conditions are rotator cuff pathology and it's important to test their range of motion of the shoulders in abduction, forward elevation, external rotation, internal rotation, and also test their supraspinatus strength against resistance with the arms turned in. It's important to rule out carpal tunnel syndrome by looking for a tinel sign directly over the carpal tunnel and to rule out ulnar nerve neuropraxia at the elbow or at the wrist in the cubital tunnel. If a patient has cervical radiculopathy, the most commonly involved levels are C6 and C7. It isn't that unusual though to have radiculopathy involving other levels in the cervical spine. If the patient has radiculopathy of the C6 nerve root, oftentimes they'll complain of numbness or pain going down along the radial forearm into the thumb and index finger. They may have sensory changes in the same area. They may have motor changes involving the C6 nerve root. The muscles involved with C6 motor function are the wrist extensors. So you have them extend their wrist, keep it there tight, and you see what the strength in the wrist extensors is by trying to push down. They may have weakness with elbow flexion. You ask them to flex their muscle and try and extend their arm by pulling down on the forearm. With C6 nerve root involvement, you may also have a diminished brachioradialis reflex. So you hold the arm relaxed in your hand and tap down on the brachioradialis tendon. As you tap down, the wrist extends and you may get slight elbow flexion as well. If a patient has C7 radiculopathy, they'll complain of pain going down their dorsal forearm going down into the dorsum of their hand and oftentimes into the long finger dorsally. They may have numbness or tingling in the same distribution. They can have weakness in C7 innervated muscles. The C7 innervated muscles are the triceps, the wrist flexors, and the finger extensors. The way we test the triceps is to have them extend their elbow ask them to keep the elbow straight and see how much strength they have by trying to break the extension. You test their wrist flexors by having them flex their wrist, keep it down and try and lift up against their muscle strength. You test finger extensors by having them straighten their fingers and make sure that they can keep the fingers straight. It's very helpful to compare it to the opposite side whenever you're testing a muscle to ensure that this is in fact a true nerve root weakness and not generalized weakness that the patient has. They can have weakness in the C7 innervated reflex which will be the triceps reflex. So you have them rest their forearm on your hand, make sure the triceps is nice and relaxed and you tap on the triceps tendon that makes the forearm extend reflexly.